So what does privacy law protect? At bottom, privacy law tries to protect individual autonomy and well-being in two ways. By giving people a measure of control over data that relate to them, and by prohibiting and punishing certain actions others take regarding those data that society considers harmful. Privacy law must balance these considerations with the fact that data are rarely wholly ours. Others have legitimate relationships with those data too. For example, is my bank account balance my data or the bank's? And it must balance these considerations with the fact that other important values are served by others accessing and using data about us. Protecting public health and safety is one such value. Think contact tracing to track the spread of COVID-19. Free flow of ideas and expression is another. Think news reporting. Scholarly research is another. American law tries to strike the right balance through a patchwork of laws at the federal, state, and even local levels. The U.S. is a federalist system, which means that both the federal and state governments have their own lawmaking powers. Congress has the power to pass laws regulating interstate and inter international commerce, while states and their political subdivisions have the power to regulate local affairs. All levels of government have been active when it comes to privacy law. The result is a combination of constitutional privacy rights that limit government invasion of privacy, individual privacy statutes covering different sectors, technologies, or data types, and a series of judicially developed state law invasion of privacy claims. This may sound daunting to researchers, especially when you consider that TDM research by definition involves a large volume of records, which raises the stakes of any privacy law violation. Many privacy laws do not apply to scholarly TDM activities, however. We can take constitutional privacy uh, protections off the table for a start. The Constitution protects against unreasonable searches and seizures of private data and limits the government's right to compel disclosure of personal matters as part of a regulatory program. But constitutional rules apply to government actors, which means they don't apply in any event to researchers at private institutions. Plus, they are designed to limit the coercive powers of government. Although a researcher's public university may be deemed part of state government and therefore subject to federal and state constitutional rules, this shouldn't affect the researchers who presumably have no institutional powers to coerce research subjects into doing or disclosing anything. What about statutes? Many of them won't apply to academic TDM research either, especially humanities research, at least not directly. This is because they either apply to government agencies or commercial actors, or because they just involve data and activities that don't arise with humanities TDM. For example, the Federal Privacy Act of 1974 governs what federal agencies can do with data they collect about individuals. San Francisco's ban on facial recognition software prevents police and other agencies from using the technology. The two broadest data privacy laws in the nation, the Federal Trade Commission Act and California's new Consumer Privacy Act, both apply to commercial actors, and most of the other laws whose acronyms litter this slide are about commercial actors or types of data that typically are not relevant to humanities research. Keep in mind, too, that state and federal privacy laws do not apply to anonymized or sufficiently de-identified data. This visual guide from the Future of Privacy Forum sets out a helpful taxonomy of de-identification. In a world of pervasive digital data, it isn't easy to achieve de-identification, and it may be impossible in some cases. The law doesn't require the impossible, however. HIPAA, for example, defines de-identified data as data that does not identify an individual and with respect to which there is no reasonable basis to believe that the information could be used to identify an individual. HIPAA allows de-identification by either removing 18 personal identifiers or having an expert determine that the risk is very small that the information could be used, alone or in combination with other reasonably available information, to identify a data subject. I've also given you a link here to FERPA guidance on de-identifying student records as another example. Having said all this, it is possible that a TDM project could implicate a privacy statute, depending on the data involved. A quick consultation, if there is such a thing, with institutional counsel or a chief privacy officer should help answer this. Some privacy laws do apply to nonprofits as well as commercial actors. FERPA, which governs student records privacy, is one example. 
Illinois' new Biometric Information Privacy Act is another. It bars private entities, which includes nonprofits, from collecting, obtaining, or disclosing someone's behavioral or physiological biometric identifier without express written consent from the individual. And Washington State recently considered, but didn't pass, a sweeping data privacy law that would have included nonprofits. Where privacy statutes are likely to have their greatest impact on TDM, however, is indirectly by regulating the activities of public and commercial data sources in ways that may reduce or complicate the availability of data for research. For example, under the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, parents may revoke their consent and require deletion of their children's personal information, including photos, videos, and audio files from websites. And those sites may only keep information for as long as reasonably necessary to fulfill the purposes for which the information was collected. Under FERPA, schools may only allow researchers limited access to student data for studies to help improve student learning or administer aid programs. The Federal Privacy Act limits external researchers to de-identified and statistical uses of data that federal agencies collect about individuals. Consider the types of data at issue in the use cases, namely tweets and YouTube videos that people voluntarily posted. Historically, U.S. privacy law has viewed the voluntary posting of data on the Internet as a waiver, essentially, of any reasonable expectation of privacy in those data. I don't expect that to change in the near future. However, courts are beginning to question whether, in a world of pervasive digital data sharing and capture, people may reasonably expect some privacy even in what they do publicly, at least when aggregating those data can paint an intimate picture of their lives. The Supreme Court raised this concern a few years ago. It also recently held that sharing personal data with service providers does not automatically eliminate any reasonable expectation of privacy in those data. While those cases involve law enforcement and not research, they are likely to influence the broader debate over what privacy interests the law should protect. Additionally, federal courts have upheld the Federal Trade Commission's power to regulate commercial data privacy and security practices under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which bans unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. The FTC has brought hundreds of Section 5 cases against companies that violate their own privacy policies or fail to use reasonable data, privacy, and security measures to protect personally identifiable information. The agency looks to industry best practices and societal norms to gauge what is reasonable. So, as these concepts evolve, that will presumably affect what the FTC requires of companies handling personal data, including social media companies. Last year, for example, the FTC imposed a $5 billion, that's $5 billion with a B, dollar fine against Facebook for misleading users about how their personal data were being shared with other apps. The settlement also required a thorough overhaul of Facebook's privacy programs designed to strengthen users' ability to control data sharing. This may have a ripple effect on the availability of Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram user data for research purposes. Consider, too, the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, which I mentioned before, which regulates how companies doing business in California handle any data that identifies, relates to, describes, is capable of being associated with, or could reasonably be linked directly or indirectly with a particular consumer or household. Among other things, the CCPA gives California residents a right to request that a business delete their personal information, which would include even publicly displayed data. While the law allows businesses to refuse to delete information needed for research purposes, that particular exception is narrow and requires that the person have consented to the research. The passage of the CCPA has inspired several other state privacy laws and bills. The situation is renewing co uh, calls for Congress to pass a single, comprehensive federal data privacy law that would supersede state laws, harmonize existing protections, and offer a single clear regime for data subjects and data users. Experts do not expect such a law in the near term. And frankly, any time anyone says that a single clear law is coming, you should be skeptical. 
It would be helpful, though, uh, in debates over new federal and state privacy legislation to, be, to have those debates be well informed about the types and values of TDM research. Researchers can help by making institutional counsel, privacy officials, and government relations personnel aware of problems that privacy laws may be posing to research, including whether researchers or collaborators are shying away from legitimate projects for fear of inadvertently violating privacy laws. It's certainly the case that the complex labyrinth of privacy laws discourages some data sources from collaborating with researchers. Unless the proposed research presents a clear and direct benefit to the data source, it's often easier to just say no and avoid compliance costs and potential legal and reputational risk. We've talked about constitutional and statutory privacy laws, but haven't yet discussed state common law privacy rules and their relationship to TDM. We turn to that next.